Cecily. Cecily. Surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lessons. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. <sighs> Dear Uncle Jack, is so, so very serious. Sometimes he's so serious, I cannot believe he's quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanour is especially to be commended when so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a high sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that's why I often look a little bored when we three are together. Cecily! I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in this conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. I'm sure we'd have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. You certainly would. You know, geology and German and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. <laughs> you must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I probably should forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels you make me read. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in early days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are! I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. <laughs> the good ended happily, the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems so unfair. Was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in a sense of lost or <laughs> mislaid. To your work, child. These speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chesable coming up for the garden. Dr. Chesable? This is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, I trust you are well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do us so much good to have a short stroll in the park with you, Dr. Chasuble. <laughs> Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not my German lessons when the rector came in. Oh, Cecily, I hope you're not inattentive. I'm afraid I am. <clears throat> well, that's strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang up on her lips. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. <laughs> My metaphor was drawn from bees. Um, Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday afternoons in London. He's not one of those <coughs> whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical allusion merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at even song. I think, dear Doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all. And the walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism. With pleasure. We might go as far as... As the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, 
You will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. <laughs> Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy, horrid German, horrid geography. A Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven off from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was very anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Worthing to come here. And I suppose you better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B for the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. I never really met any wicked person before. <laughs> I feel rather frightened. I'm afraid he will look just like anyone else. He does. You are my little cousin Cecily, I am sure. You are a mistake. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily, and you, I see from your card, are my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh. I'm not really wicked at all, cousin oh. Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. Well, if you're not, then you've certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you've not been leading a double life, pretending to be really wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. <laughs> oh. Of course, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention the subject. I have been very bad in my own small way. I'm not so sure you should be so proud of that. But it sounds rather pleasant. It's much pleasanter being here with you. But I can't understand why you're here at all. Uncle Jack won't be home till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. <laughs> I'm bound to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business engagement I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere else but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Hmm. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But I still think it's better you wait until Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to talk to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He's gonna have to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. <laughs> I don't think you'll require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Oh. He said at dinner on Wednesday night that you have to choose between this world, the next, and Australia. <laughs> oh well, the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? No, I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon, then? It's rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You're looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires wholesome and regular meals. Won't you come in? Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have an appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. Uh, ma chère No. I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. Don't think it's right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never said such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. <laughs> you are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I'd care to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> 